We are at the SL shop where I have been absolutely honored to drive, privileged to drive the 300 SL uh, Resto Mod Sports Line. And uh, on top of that, we're gonna be given a great experience today. Sam Bailey, CEO of the SL shop, is here to talk to us about everything SL and everything you do here in your pretty awesome facility up in uh, Motor Valley here near, uh, near Stratford-upon-Avon. Sports like Mercedes. Why specifically? Why specifically this type of Mercedes-Benz? Well, uh, for us, um, SLs has, has been in our blood. So Bruce and I started the business um, just over 15 years ago. The business really started as a hobby for me. I left school, went into retail, um, went into corporate sales, but cars were in my blood. My father worked for Mercedes. I was um, on the drive helping him fix the cars at the weekends. I was at school at the back of the class with Auto Trader sort of beginning some trading in my early teenage years and it, and it went on from there. So even when I had a corporate job, I was always tinkering with cars at the weekends. Um, all sorts of classic cars in the early days, but I decided to be a specialist at one thing and because I'd spent so much time around Mercedes and SLs are the collectible car, SL seemed the way to go. So we started the SL shop, which to be quite honest, I'm, I regret the name now, but um, it started, it's there, it's 15 years old, I can't change it, so we are the SL shop. Everybody knows you're here. Exactly, yeah. Um, is there a model, a specific model, which, which got you into this type of car? Surely there was one that, you, that, that you immediately comes to mind when you have the SL bloodline uh, in, in mind. I guess it depends on how old you are, but for me, born in the early 70s, it would be the 107 SL. So most of us that are into classic cars are into them through some form of nostalgia or aspiration. So when I was a child, when I was at school, it was the 107 that was the car to own. You know, obviously the previous generation, it would be the Pagoda or the 190 SL or, or going back even more than that. But, but for me, you know, those people, when I saw a 107 SL, I mean, they were ferociously expensive. You could buy a house in the, in the suburbs of Birmingham where I lived for the same cost of one of those, uh, those cars. So they, they were the aspirational car. And there wasn't anybody, 15 years ago, there wasn't anybody in the space of 107 SLs. So we have, there, there's a lot going for them. I had the chance to drive one today. You've tweaked it, you've perfected it. Yeah. A great machine yeah, yeah. out there on the road. So you started with just you, basically, a yep. couple of you putting these cars together. Yep. Uh, how many people do you now employ here on this site? Well, we started with two and 15 years later, we've got 52 now. So that's across three, three types, three areas of the business. There's car sales, there's our workshops and there's our parts store. So all of those three tend to work in conjunction with each other. And luckily for me as a business owner, they tend to be equal in terms of their contribution to, to the, the business here. Well, what are we doing standing here then? Can you, uh, would you be kind enough to give us a, a bit of a look around sure, your that'd facility? Be that'd, that'd be, be super. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, starting here in our showrooms, um, nothing's really changed for us in terms of the volume of cars we sell. So we tend to sell about two cars a week from these showrooms here, tend to have about 50 in stock at any one time. What has changed, of course, is the calibre of the cars and the kind that we get. We're, we're, we're able to select the very best cars that are available, presented to us. We turn down probably about eight or nine or ten that we're offered um, and select only the very best ones to sell. So the, the models that we sell here are the best of their kind. You must have some, some very interesting clientele. We won't drop any names, but we have seen interesting clientele even today yeah. uh, in and out of the showroom. Yeah, that chap is a real hero of mine, by the way. <laughs> but half of the, half of the kids here don't know when I'm doing the catchphrases that that guy's famous for, they're like, what? What are you talking about? But you get the chance, uh, the great thing about classic cars, you get the chance to meet so many interesting people and so many people that are enthusiastic about the same thing in, in the big wide world. Does it surprise you who you get, who will ring you up and go, I'm really interested in what you're doing. Uh, will you make me a car? Will you, will you yeah. sort my car out? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of that that goes on. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of people from the sort of media that tend to be customers, but there's a lot of, because of the design of the cars, there's a lot of artists, architects, um, those kind of folks are really into these cars as well, as well as the, the everyday folk that just always wanted to own one, a bit like me, always wanted to own one, perhaps didn't have the means to own one back in the day and have now. So there is a total blend of customers. Believe it or not, we've got 24,000 people that have either bought a car, had a service or bought a part from us. Well, it's, it's a big, big database it's to manage. A, it's a massive database and you can see why. I mean, the proportions of some of this stuff are just outstanding utterly, utterly beautiful selection of Mercedes. So you, you come through here, you have your premium stock, it yep. must be here. Yep. 
and then uh, and you have people come in here just like a, a showroom, rock up, buy a car. Also a bit of consignment stuff for customers. Yeah, yep. quite, quite a few of these cars in here are on consignment. So you can imagine folks that own these cars tend not to like people traipsing through their house and traipsing through their garage. So they'll give us, us the car to sell. We'll assess the car in the workshop, make sure that it is good enough to have here in our, in our showrooms, prepare them for sale, put them on sale, give them a warranty and, and that kind of stuff. Will you show us the workshop? Yeah, so sure, that'd be, that'd be great, so yeah. This is sort of key to the, the car sales really. Quite a few of our customers are buying cars that don't have space themselves to keep them. Some of them keep them and just use them for the summer. They live abroad. So we've got about 20 odd cars in, in there. If you just want to pop oh, your well, head after, in there. After me. Yeah, pop your head in there. <laughs> there's, there's generally, well, it's summer now, so there's a few cars out, but we tend to keep um, quite a few cars in there for customers and they were either recycled, put back in the showroom or they're just used and then taken to their country of residence or whatever it is. So all, all different cars, yep. all different marks, you're just offering yep. offering storage to customers and yep. that's, that's available yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Main, mainly Mercs, but I think there's a Bentley that snuck its way in there. I think he snuck in today, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. So what, three, three types of, of specialism in the workshop, what we call heritage specialists and modern classics. So heritage of the cars from the sort of 50s through to the 70s, specialist 70s through to the 90s, and then 90s onwards of modern classics. So SLs, uh, known as the 129 SL or the R230, go from, from that era onwards. So where do, where do Mercedes fit into all of this? Obviously, you've got an unbroken bloodline of SLs through from 1954. There surely must be a point where your servicing finishes and Mercedes servicing begins. How does that whole interplay work for you? Well, it's interesting you say actually, because the, the local Mercedes dealers, when they get anything that's sort of beyond 10 years old, tend to either pick up the phone to us or quite often, luckily for me, refer their customers to me. So I think obviously their focus is on the modern stuff, on stuff probably up to 10 years old, where there's a lot of volume for them there. But once some of the, some of the older cars get slightly more complex, issues related to age and mileage we're the experts to fix those so um, we tend to work in conjunction they refer one or two customers to us and we buy quite a few parts from them so it works well so does that mean that you're getting uh, new cars into sort of your basket year on year on year as those cars become uh, the, those dealers become unable to service those cars yeah you must be kind of continuously preparing then to receive the next year of historic SL yep. to, to be able to work with that. Yeah, there is that. And, and you know, we're constantly investing in, in new diagnostic um, uh, equipment to, to be able to do that. There is, of course, a timeline of any car. So they start, they come out of the showroom, they're at a certain price, and then they depreciate to a certain point, and then they go into the doldrums, don't they? Any car has that kind of situation, and Mercedes are no different. So those cars live in the doldrums for a little while before they become to be appreciated. So for example, the 129 SL, the uh, black vehicle there, the second one along, they are appreciated more and more now. Ferociously expensive when they were new. When the R230 came out that replaced that with the electric folding roof, if you can remember, everybody ran to those. So everybody wanted that new shape with the folding roof and everything else. And those cars came in the doldrums. Then, of course, people realised that actually take out the folding roof, the engineering in that era of Mercedes perhaps wasn't as good as the 80s and 90s cars and then there's a renaissance for those 129s. So those 129s become interesting, become more valuable, start to appreciate value. Collectors begin to say, well, I'll buy the first, the first and the last types of those. You know, quite often yeah. that's what collectors do, isn't it? They buy the first and the last of any, any kind of production. So that then fuels interest in those models. Similarly, similarly the W124 E-Class uh, Cabriolet there, you know, four-seater convertible. There's not many four-seater classic convertibles that you can own. So that's of an interest to quite a few people. So I'm, I'm going to ask you for a heard it here first tip then. If, if, if you're going to buy a model year now, yeah. which model year should our lovely viewers be, be looking at for the, for, the, for, the next, for the next price hike? Which is the investable uh, SL Mercedes right now? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And I think if I knew the answer to that, I'd be, I'd well, be keeping you, it to myself. Well, if you don't, yeah, then yeah, we yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, I, think the, I think 107s have got room to grow. I think they're completely 
underappreciated. They're so practical, they're so usable. They tread the line between a classic with the charm that, uh, that a classic car gives you and the smile it puts on your face with the practicality of being able to use them, tour with them, leave them in the garage for months on end, jump in and, and, and rely on them. So these have got more to go for sure. Pagodas seem to be on an ever-increasing um, price hike and when you look at the cost of parts and the cost of ration, um, cost of restoration, you can really understand why those cars are now fetching £300,000 because it costs nearly that to restore one. So there's a, there's a direct link there. 107s have got more to go. 129s are interesting. 129s are really interesting, especially with the right engine. You get the right late engine 129 in the right colours, the right spec, and they are, they are a joy. Yeah, a, a lot of different engine specifications. I was interested when I looked through the, the history, yeah. you know, moving through all of the inline stuff yeah. and then up into the, the V8s, V6s, yeah, yeah. V6s, V8s. And yeah. uh, it's surprising to see a bloodline of car change. I mean, I suppose you have a little bit of that going on with, with Jags, but, but not so much. Uh, it's just surprising to see them move between engine specifications so yeah. readily. When you look at the inline six in the engine bay, you can tell a V8 can go in. Yes. <laughs> it, yeah, it, yeah, really, yeah. it really is there. So, well, 107s, yeah, maybe price appreciating, especially if restored by the SL shop. Yep, absolutely, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So let's say you, you've got a car that needs more than, you know, a bit of engine work, a bit of cosmetic work. Mm -hmm. What goes on next? You told me there's a fabrication yeah, there. Yeah, there is. Yeah, we'll, we'll go out through the, the shop here and, and, uh, and pick that, pick that uh, department up. So um, we'll come to the heritage shop in a moment, but quite often the, the fab shop will be dealing with either full restorations, either for ourselves or, or on commission by a customer, or quite often perhaps cars that are bought on other sources such as eBay or wherever that might be. Um, and back of the back of the garage yeah. cash. And here's an example that came into us actually just a few days ago. So um, this is a, a 107 that was commissioned with another restoration company to be done. Um, they didn't have the time to build it, so they outsourced they outsourced the fabrication to another firm. And lo and behold, it wasn't done to the right standard. And you can actually even see by some of the um, even to the untrained eye, some of the absolute shocking repairs that have been done in the past to this vehicle. So this vehicle will be completely repaneled by the wizards in here and it will take quite some hours to get these, this body back the way it should be, pin perfect, ready to go to our paint shop. Do you have vehicles arrive here that you have to say, unfortunately, to the owner, look, yep. I'm really sorry your, your vehicle is, is not capable of repair? Yep, there's quite a bit of that. Um, and, and worse than that, we have some Pagodas, those, those high value 60s cars that are super shiny on the surface. And just recently, in fact, last week, we found one that was made of two cars. Yes. That, that went on, that went on in the 70s and the 80s, and there's still a few horror stories out there. So. Yeah, there are, there, are, there are some really scary stories. So to look at these cars, what, it, what are the critical, say you were gonna, say you were gonna buy this chassis, yeah. what are the critical elements you would look at? Well, where, are, where are your trained eyes going? Yeah, one of the key areas when the Achilles heels for the 107 SL is this bulkhead area here. So this is where the heater blower sits and water essentially gets trapped in that area, sits, sits in this area, rots out, and, and the effect of that is of course water then begins to go in the cabin. So you get wet carpets, musty interior, yep. no fun for anyone. So that's, that's one of the key areas the Achilles heel on the 107 SL. But of course, and when you look around this shell, you can see that where the seals tend to rust, from 86 to 89, the cars were galvanized, but I don't think the galvanization was at the, level. at the level that it should be in those stages. So even the later cars that are allegedly galvanized still rust in this section here, especially in the front and the back. Wheel arches, boot wells, um, the spare wheel well tends to rot out, floor pans tend to go. Um, this car looks like it's had an attempt at floor pans. Um, so it looks like these guys will be putting those in the way they should have been done in the first place. So it's, it's, it's not unlike any other car from the 70s really, they rust. So it just depends on how they've been stored, how they've been used and whether drain holes have been unblocked as to the level of rust. Wow. Say everything's gone well, even with an older car than this, they, they might make the grade for the, for the heritage shop. Yeah, so the heritage shop tends to focus more, thanks fellas, the heritage shop tends to focus more on vehicles from the 
uh, 50s through to the 70s, mainly because there's a slightly different kind of engine for the, that generation of Mercedes. The injection system is different um, uh, and it's just a different skill set required. So the heritage shop tends generally to focus on cars from that era. Um, we've also got our engine room in here. So when an engine comes back from one of our engine builders, we tend to run it up and get it tuned correctly in, in the engine room first. And then we know it's ready to drop into the, drop into the car. Matt, could you just turn the tunes down? Thanks. Talk to me about engines because you've got, as we've discussed, a lot of different specifications yep. potentially, yep. but they're quite specialist engines now, aren't they? With yep. the, the big block in line sixes uh, and then, you know, some, some injection systems that are not now currently still in production. Yep. It must be a vast uh, contact book yep. to get all of the different elements. How do you manage that process? Yeah, that is exactly our strength because we have got connections all over the world, you know, a lot in Europe, as you can expect, a lot in Germany, but quite a bit in the US as well, actually. We've got connections for parts. We've got a lot of no longer available parts. Whenever we see a stash of parts available for sale, we'll buy those. So if it's got rare pistons or rare camshafts or whatever else in it. So we work in conjunction with en engine builders for the machining because we don't have machines on site. Mm. But when it comes to the components, everything from the heavy components such as pistons and con rods and you know, camshafts through to the gaskets will supply. So we've got a really strong relationship with our engine builder. We expect them to do the machining, we'll supply the parts. What comes back from the engine builder is an engine ready to go. We then build it with our expertise here, get the injection system right, get the tuning right, and then it's ready to drop in the car. Of course, that gives you the opportunity to optimize several of those parts that you then take the base block and yep. you can go, ah, maybe we'll have some lighter pistons, maybe exactly we'll have some different yeah. balance, yeah. 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 et cetera, yeah. and just make those cars uh, a little bit special. That's right, and, and I mean, just now, I think, I think we might even walk past them in a minute. We've just had some cams from Piper. So whilst they might be famous for working with race engines, of course, they've got the technology to help us profile the kind of cams we want. So whether that's a race cam, whether that's a road rally cam, we build quite a few road rally cars, these folks that do these road rallies, yeah. either in the UK or further afield, and they just want a bit of extra torque low down. They don't want their power at the top. To they wait for four grand. They don't need that, they need it lower down. But you know, there's, there's so much opportunity with Mercedes engines because they were built to such high tolerances you can get away with quite a lot. You can get, you can really- Proper German Yeah, stuff. you can, exactly, yeah, yeah. You're excited uh, to show us this car here. Yeah, so um, actually this car came to us um, as one of our customers that comes on road Look rallies with us. Um, and um, we've decided we're gonna do a bit of an engine rebuild on it. So that's what's happening there with this one, uh, but a super rare color combination, a 190 SL, four cylinder, carburetor, pre-injection, Fabulous. And what a, what a magnificent car to own that. <laughs> I mean, they just don't make them like that anymore, no, do they? it's beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely stunning, yeah. And uh, like you say, awesome car combination. What yeah, a it's, it's, the ride height's completely wrong now before you tell me off because the engine's not in it. So that's why it's sitting up high. <laughs> I don't know. I think there are some people that would get into that, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely beautiful. What a privilege it is to still be able to preserve these yeah, things. Yeah. And it's um, when you when you take the covers off something like this, it just gives you a just gives you a bit of a buzz. It yeah. shows you why we we all do what we do. Yeah, we get um, gooey for these things, don't we? And then and then through here we've got um, probably some more cabriolets in a saloon. So of course the saloons had you know in, back in the day the sort of the predecessor to the super saloon was the six point three. Um, which, well, that's actually a 3.5, but it was that body shell that, that had either a straight six engine, a 3.5 V8, but of course they dropped the 6.3 V8 in that, and that was the Red Pig racing car. You might have actually okay. seen that Red Pig AMG yes. racing car from the 70s. So we work on quite a few of those as well. And, and you know, the engines and the technology, they cross over. So the six cylinder engines are the same as that you'd find in the Pagoda, but the eight cylinder, so that's a 350, 3.5 V8, that's the same engine as you'd find in an early 107. So, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of crossing over yeah, body shells to engine generation. You've got an engine generation relay going Correct. on. Correct, exactly that, yeah. Some yeah. interesting specifications in here. Have you ever said no to a, to a customer based on... You never you know, say no to customers, <laughs> do you? What, <laughs> no. we, what we do is we try and advise and we say, well, you've got some originality there and, and you're compromising that originality. Do you want to walk away from that originality? And if you're sure, you're sure, you're sure, these are the options available to us. But in the main, I think our, our business, our core business is 
rebuilding to original spec. The sport line that you've driven is just an opportunity for somebody to make that car a little bit more drivable if mm. they want it. And it certainly is. Um, uh, and if we, if you want to, then we've built a race car as well, and we can we can take it even further. Now we're you talking. Know, within the constraints. Of, yeah, I thought you might like that. <laughs> within the constraints of whatever series that it is, whether you know it's a historic series or, or an, an open classification, and we were thinking about putting you know, a 129 engine, a late 500 129 engine, which comes with 326 horsepower, I think, a standard, yeah. into that 107. And, and then we've got the opportunity to make that rev harder and 50, go 50, 60 horsepower more. At least, like uh, probably 100, probably easily 100. Like I said, they are so unstressed that there's plenty to find. Lovely stuff. We, we, we like it. We like it a lot. Well, how many cars do you think move through the, the the premises every year. Have you got a count? Oh, on it? that's interesting. I think on site today is 126 cars. Um, so there's there's plenty there. So some of them are here for a long time. Some of them are here a year or two on a full restoration. That one, that that um, green pagoda there, I think it's been here for quite a while. That's had a significant amount of work done to it. Some of them, some of them are here for weeks and months. But very rarely is a car in and out the same day. You know, we have one or two customers that obviously just want a quick oil service and they come and go. Um, in the same day, but, but typically a car is here for a week or two. So servicing parts, sourcing of cars, sale of cars either that you've built or yep. that are, uh, are supplied to you by customers. Yeah. And then finally, valeting preparation yeah, for events. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through to that. Well, we'll go through the parts business. So parts is a really interesting subject. A lot are available from Mercedes-Benz. Um, but increasingly, there's a number of remanufacturers out there that are remaking parts to original specification when Mercedes don't, can't, or we can't get them. And of course, that helps preserve these cars, keep them on the road. Yeah. So our parts inventory is, is made up of Mercedes parts that we fit to cars in our workshops, um, uh, parts, OEM kind of parts that we're buying. So Bosch, of course, still make things, and yeah. Febby and those kind of manufacturers, original sort of specification manufacturers are creating parts for us. We have one or two made ourselves, one or two sort of plastic components. So the bulkhead that I showed you that rusts out on that yes. shelf, there's a little plastic cover that goes over there. We just have a local firm in Reddit to remake of some of those so that you know they crack and they get, they get brittle, so we remake those. How many times a month would you say the local Mercedes dealer ring you up and go, Sam, have you got A because we've run out? Yeah, quite often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So here across the, the parts inventory, we've got an... Um, um, obviously we supply our own workshops and that's our biggest customer but um, in addition to that we've got customers all around the world that rely on us to help keep these cars going and as I said one of the things that we're proud of doing was um, acquiring quite a lot of new old stock parts from various sources so our most recent one was a company in, um, in Holland who decided to cease trading after a number of years sadly they wanted to hand the business down to their son but he didn't want to do it he wanted to do something else instead so we went and bought Literally, no accounting for taste. <laughs> we went and bought 45 years worth of their parts inventory to add to our new old stock base, and that, that really helps things, keeps, keep, keeps things going. And but you have the confidence that there's going to be a marketplace for the cars absolutely. into the future, which yeah. is, a, yeah. which is a, a credit to you yeah, and, yeah, a, yeah. And, a great, and a great asset to yeah, have yeah. if you've got that customer base, they're yeah, going to yeah. need those bits. Well, I mean, that, that particular trip was three articulated wagons coming back from Holland and, and the guys here, there's some proper geeks in that office, you know, they were opening packets of, um, you know, things like a, a full wiring loom for a 1960s pagoda, completely brand new, vacuum sealed in, in a packet. And yeah. it's just heaven, for a restorer, that is just an, a, 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 a component from, from heaven. So yeah, so I mean, an example of that Holland Hall was, um, because they, the firm were a restorer as well as um, a parts company, they, they were beginning to restore these. So we've got the back end of a pagoda here. So you can see the, the complexity of, of the engineering of, of the car from that era and, and how they managed to get the, the various suspension components together. Yeah, I'm just working, I'm working with this random spring yeah. mid, mid axle yeah. to yeah. try to figure and, out and, what and that, that is. of course is crucial to the ride height of the car and you'll probably see pagodas, you'll probably see the back wheels. When you look in the showroom, you'll see quite a few of them. You know, the sit in, is, is, is an interesting like, a, like a sort of 30s Grand Prix car Correct, before yeah. they roll. And that's all to do with whether it's got the correct spring in, in that location. Interesting is that. Uh, it is. It is an era just full of uh, finding the the way, isn't it? Yes. Uh, engineering wise, yeah, there are yeah, so yeah, many yeah, different yeah. solutions. Yeah. And this looks like a pristine space. So, yeah. valeting preparation. Yeah. So every car that, whether it has an oil service or a full restoration, will will come in here for some love and attention from the boys in here, the magicians in here. So whether the car's leaving to go to its 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 
existing home or to a new home, it will come through this, this shop first of all. There's something uh, a little bit special about handing a, handing a nice sparkly clean yeah, one exactly, back, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Sam, absolutely brilliant. Thanks so much for the run in the car. Thanks so much for showing us around. Um, it's been an awesome, awesome day. Thank you very much. Thank you.